This is CIA, Contagious Influencers of America. I'm David Sams, along with my good friend and life coach, Tim Story. Excited to be on the program today. We have a big one, one that we've been waiting for for a while. I have one of my absolute favorite people on today. One of these people that you just want to melt when she's in front of you, but she is probably the most authentic artist that I have ever had the opportunity to break bread with, and that's Amy Grant. And she's one of my favorite people because there's no holding back. She says it like it is. She's not afraid to talk about the life that she has lived. And she's open about the fact that she went from recovery to discovery Mm -hmm. and had to move on. You're going to hear about her highs, about her lows, about her uh, divorce, about her coming into and being part of a blended family, which yes. she and Vince got together and, and how the two families came together, the kids came together, and what that was all about and what they dealt with and what they, you know, some of the struggles they had and how she overcame and the, the kids were able to overcome some of those things. Something that I, I had a little something to do with, I had the opportunity a couple of years ago when we were in the studio. Uh, to have her there the day that Lauren Daigle was in the studio. And she and Lauren had never met one another before. And, of course, Lauren is now the biggest thing in music. Uh, She was just recently on The Tonight Show. She was on uh, The Ellen Show. Uh, She has seven or eight hits on the Billboard charts right now, especially on the Christian charts, but she's crossing over. And a couple of years ago when she was in the studio, I wanted her to uh, basically uh, sit down with Amy for 20 minutes or so and for Amy to give her some guidance, some mentorship as to what to expect one of these days when she's bigger than life. And I just had that feeling that Lauren was going to be that person. And so I put them together and I'll never forget, Lauren had the biggest eyes looking at Amy Grant feed her with her mentorship. See, that's part of you being the veteran David Sams. And I think we've got something very rare, very unique today, because we get to hear them dialogue with each other. And wait until you hear the five phrases that Amy tries to live her entire life by. Wow, wow, There is so much wisdom in this interview that you're about to hear. This is the Amy Grant that you very rarely hear speak. Just the tidbits of wisdom that she has to offer is just off the charts as far as I'm concerned. I love it. Unique, never happened before, and we're about to listen to it. So, Amy, the last time we were together, actually, it was a couple of times ago, I had you here the day that Lauren Daigle was here. Yes. And she met you for the first time. Yep. And you gave her, like, I, I, I just remember we let the mics go and we we let you just give her 20 minutes of advice. I've never seen somebody's eyes so big in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm telling you, that... That woman is on a fast train. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's funny. I loved listening to Lauren Daigle's new record. And I mean, I turned it up loud. I lit candles. Rest of the lights off. There's only one first listen. And I just, I loved it. And there was so much anticipation for her record, you know. And I thought it was great. It just took me on such a journey. I danced. I laughed. I got choked up. Um, And I did reach out to her weeks later, you know, but it was more like, hey, if you want to sit in a room and not say anything, I'd I'd love to be sitting there with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And I never did hear from her. Mm. But all I could think of was, man, I bet she does not have a lot of headspace right now. Mm -mm. You you went through that. I I mean, you went through that where it went from you to having the people, right? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yep. What's that like when when you go through that transition? Do you know that it's happening? Does it take on a life of its own and you just kind of go with it? At what point do you say, you know what, I love my people, but I just have to be me right now and let my hair down and just be me and not have my people around like for a few days? 
Right. Well, that's a lot of questions in one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hopefully your people. My people. <laughs> hopefully my people, whoever your people are, being whoever you are. Well, oh, you know, coming be. coming from yeah. Hollywood, we always had my people will call your people. <laughs> right, right. But hopefully every person that's in a high-pressure work situation has surrounded themselves. Hopefully my people are people I trust mm-hmm. and that can also kind of read the lay of the land because nobody has endless energy, Mm-mm. you know. Um, and different things are stressful for some people and not stressful for others. You know, room after room after room with a lot of people is one person's green zone and somebody else is like, I want to be rocking in the corner in a fetal position, you know, because creative personalities, they can kind of run that entire gamut. Mm-hmm. I'll never forget being at a dinner. Carol King was being honored. It was before the Grammys. <clears throat> and Lady Gaga got up and she was playing piano and she said, Carol, every woman in this room that has pursued music has spent countless hours in their room alone with you, every one of us. And we were all silent for a minute went, well, yeah, every creative person, period, has spent countless hours alone trying to figure out what is my voice? What is my instrument? How do I express myself? You know, so you've got a little bit of a <laughs> strange, I, I need isolation part of component in your personality anyway. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then you throw that on a big public stage. And you think, oh, don't forget what your go-to things are. You have to remember, how do I de-stress? When you were crossing over from Christian to to pop, what years would you say was the sort of bam year or two? Well, my thing came in waves. Mm -hmm. I remember in the mid-'80s, I did a, a tour and we did a complete tour, but something was happening bef- before the tour ended. I mean, it lasted almost a year. But before the tour ended, we were going back to the cities that we had already played, but going to the arenas. Mm. And that was in the context wow. of one tour. And so that was the first time I was like, what is going on here? What, you know? So I was married, but I didn't have children. But that was just a lot of time. That was a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, You know, and there were some pitfalls to that. So, you know, I think the hard thing about just being in a suspended state of existence away from all the things that tend to ground you is that you kind of feel like you're in a gravity-free zone and it's easier to make... Um, I, it, it's it becomes increasingly easier to make choices you would not have made if you had never been sort of plucked out of your normal life. So you were married to uh, Gary Chapman uh-huh. at that time, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And was he on the road with you? Yes, he was. Okay. So yeah. you guys were going through your stuff, Yeah. right? Now, can you imagine today with the internet and social media and everything else that, that's out there? That, that was my point. You, you, <laughs> you, you sort of had the opportunity at being before the internet like hit, which was like the mid nineties. Hallelujah! Right? Is all I can oh, say. Oh my gosh! Hallelujah. Can you imagine going through that today? <laughs> <laughs> there are experiences and stories that all of us will take to our grave. All of us. Oh, yeah. you can share one. Nope. No. Uh-uh. No. <laughs> No. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a much different time. You know, everybody is so up in each other's business, Mm -hmm. you know, and life is Lord willing long. And we learn a lot of our best lessons the hard way, you know, failure is, is a great teacher. Um, Failure with character, failure with ideas. I mean... What is the one thing that you failed at, okay? We know all of all the things you succeeded at, but what is the one thing that you failed at that you go, gosh, you know what? I I really wanted to do this or be this or feel this, but it just did not work out. But 
By golly, I tried it. Yeah. But wasn't good at it. Well, my, my mind goes to more. I don't. I, I, from a work standpoint or something like that, I don't know. I will tell you very specifically the times that I was asked to keep a secret and didn't were devastating to me. And so now that matters. It really matters. That was, you know, I've had a couple of big fails in that department. I was a, I was a child that had an active imagination. You know, I had an imaginary friend when I was little, all this kind of stuff. And so for me, just harnessing in my imagination made me, made, it, lying was very easy for me. I didn't even think about it as lying. You know, and I would notice that trait in in my children, and I thought, well, and I would say it was an exciting story without the extra five details, which, by the way, weren't true. And now, for me, lying is a deal breaker, an absolute deal breaker. And so, and I, and I've told my, my kids <laughs> at different times in their life when, of course, they were just lying to save themselves. <laughs> but I would say. I'm, I, I could be hanging by a piece of dental floss over a flame, like a bit, like a bonfire, and that that thread of dental floss is my certainty that my husband Vince is telling me the truth. I would stake my life on it, mm, mm. And I said, it, at some point, it will matter to you mm -hmm. that you can stake your life on somebody's word. Mm -hmm. And I said, it is equally important to me that the people that count on me, that they know they can count on me. And so, you know, I mean, to me, that feels like the greatest responsibility of, the, of a parent of adult children and just being a friend, you know. And and on and honesty, not just keeping secrets, but like even right now, I'm, I got a message from someone that I ha have let down, and I keep weighing what is the response, what's a truthful response. Um, you know, in life, you can connect with somebody, your personalities can gel, and you can go, oh my gosh, you feel like I feel like I've known you forever, and there are words spoken about friendship and. But then the reality of life is that we all have to take care of our own business. And so then expectations aren't met. You hurt somebody's feelings. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so even today I'm going, how do, you, how, do I, how do I respond to this amazing human being mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. without making excuses? What, what are you... What's holding you back? Is there a fear? Nothing's holding me back. I just, to me, it matters what you say mm -hmm. and how you say it and when you say it. You know, the most important thing for each of us to do, I believe, is to water the seeds that matter the most to us in our life. And I've spent different chapters of my life not doing that. This happens to be a chapter that I'm going... Okay, I mean, I need to be responsible to water the seeds that I planted. And, you know, the relationships within my family, my kids, this a creative thing that cannot be monetized. I mean, it's interesting to go, nobody else planted those seeds. You did it, girl. Mm -hmm. They matter, do they not? Mm -hmm. Water them or don't. Um, but I, you know... I think we live in a culture that we can have instant connectedness to each other. And so you can sort of get this grass fire excitement of energy with, hey, we could potentially do this together. This is a great work idea. Or, hey, let's be best friends forever. <laughs> but that's not, you know, saying I like this post or, or throwing up five pictures about your vacation. That's not what relationship is made of. Relationship is caring and watering the, the few seeds that you realistically have time to cultivate. Mm -hmm. And that, I, you know, that's a lesson that I'm having to learn now 
You just have to learn it like with every new version of connectedness in our culture. There's this euphoria of, we're all connected, which is true. We are all connected, and spiritually and technology-wise. But then the limitations of what's really possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, you know, our limitations create our style. You know, our limitations, my vocal limitations create the way that I sing Mm -hmm. and the way that I write. Mm. And my time limitations create the kind of relationships that I have. Mm, But mm -hmm. it has to be thoughtful. It has to be creative. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And so my response to this new friend that Mm -hmm. I have let down, I just want to have the thoughtful response of a a mature woman who's lived a lot of life. Um, We can't have it all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can love puppies. You can't adopt 200 puppies. Adopt one puppy mm, mm. and be a good owner. Or five if you've got a big yard. But then you're not going to travel because you've got five puppies. Mm. You know, I mean, everything is <laughs> <laughs> everything is a trade. Yeah. You uh, you have a blended family. Uh-huh. So how many kids between the two of you? Five. Jenny, his older daughter, was 17 when we got married. She's okay. 36 now. So you sort of had the Brady Bunch, right, in a way. What was the one thing you learned that you could share with other people that are going through that or thinking about going through that, that you look back on now and you have those answers? The most important thing that the lesson I I learned over and over again was when you're talking about a situation, always imagine that everybody is in the room. You can have something really tough to talk about, but even frustration and all that can you can say it in a way that you're still speaking the truth but it's done with respect so that if anybody that you were talking about entered that room they could go yeah that was hard okay yeah okay i mean respect matters you know and also you know sometimes things just feel awkward and and it's only because they're um they are awkward you know blended families if anybody had told me that I would have a lyric hung on the wall of our den that was written by Jenny my I do daughter um, it's a beautiful lyric about her parents relationship and the end of that my arrival and how she feels about me. And I mean, I've had divorced women or the second wife of a father with children read that lyric and weep. And what what was the lyric? So one Christmas morning, I opened a package, and I I think I knew it was from Jenny, only because she, you know, you can tell who gave somebody the gift they're opening because Mm -hmm. they are just maintaining such focus, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was this framed lyric, and the title is, I Couldn't Have Been More Wrong. Anyway, here was the song she wrote. Uh, They were mine, mom and dad, holding hands, our simple life, house of love. I was safe, unafraid. All we had was time. Climbing in the oak trees, roller skates, and swim team. Coming home was so easy to do. I thought life was perfect because mom and dad were mountains that would never move. And the chorus was, I I couldn't have been more wrong, and I never saw it coming. Uh, I thought that their love was forever, but I couldn't have been more wrong. Mm. Second verse, disappeared, he was gone, he moved on, I felt left behind. I cried on the day you became my father's wife. Teenage attitude, I I was cruel and rude. Blaming you was so easy to do. Every time you reached out, I would rip your heart out. 
just to punish you. And then the chorus, I couldn't have... I couldn't have been more wrong, and I've never been more sorry. You couldn't have been more patient when I couldn't have been more wrong. I couldn't have been more wrong, but you showed me forgiveness when I said I would never ever love you. Well, I couldn't have been more wrong. It chokes me up to read it. Wow. It's, that says it all. That is an amazing young woman who wrote that song. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I just look at, that says so much more about Jenny that she somehow did not stick to her guns and her perception. You know, she, she acknowledged the story of her life and she was willing to change, willing to open up her, her perspective. Mm. I know. And I have that hanging in the most public place in our house. And I always know, I'll come by and see somebody reading that and I go, okay, I know where your life is. <laughs> I could hardly read it. It got me so choked up. Anyway, I don't know if that fits the show, but. No, that, that's, that says so much. Um, you know, it's, it's um, we all go through these uh, chapters. Some of us have more chapters than others, I guess, but. Um, if you look back on your life and you think of all of the people that have that you've surrounded yourself with and all of the people who've impacted you and that you have impacted, um, it really is all about uh, one thing, and that's love. Yep. You know, everything else is sort of noise, and it's mm -hmm. some some of it's nice noise. You know, I mean, every once in a while we need a little excitement, right? Yeah. It really is pretty simple when you really think about. Um, as, as difficult as we try to make life, it really does come down to love. I've got a friend, and he's from the Bronx, and he's got a really strong accent, and he has lived nine lives. He should have been dead many times. And he, he had a transformational experience with love, with the love of God. Changed him forever. His drug habit left. His evil ways left. <laughs> he still comes across kind of rough. But he'll go, um, two rules, one prayer. Love God, love your neighbor, and forgive. That's it. Two rules, one prayer. And I, he's right. I mean, that's the whole thing. What is the one thing that you have not yet accomplished that you think that, hey, you know what? I can do that. I still want to do that. What, mm -hmm. what is the one thing that you've got in you that you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> When you first said, what's the, what's the one thing you still want to do? I thought, die. <laughs> Death. I mean, that feels like, man, that's, you talk about the threshold. Yeah. I wasn't and expecting that. I know. But then you were saying, you know, I know I've got it in me. And I was going, yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> I read a book that somebody handed me after a show one night. And it was called, the book is called Heaven is Beautiful. And it was written by a man named Peter Panagore. And I could not put it down. And I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of um, near-death or near-death experience. A lot of books have been written about that. But I just, I think because Peter waited a quarter of a century before he told his story, I, I was so taken with the story of how he died on the side of a mountain and what he went through. And... Because of because all of us, our spiritual journeys are so unique. They're rooted in the same love. They're rooted in the, the same faith. Um, they're rooted in faith, I should say, regardless of what your spiritual journey is. Um, but I was so taken by his because there's sometimes in my own life and my own experience, I'll bow my head and go, am I creating some sort of weird cult in my own head because of the uniqueness of my life? I mean, you read the Bible. I, I don't know if you think this, but I mean, in order to step out in faith in your own journey, 
it requires a kind of openness that every once in a while will make me ask myself, am I crazy? Am I crazy? Mm -hmm. Am I crazy to believe that what I think is a confirming, you know, yes, this is the right direction. I mean, there are times that you, <laughs> if you're not full of faith, you can go, I am a nutbag. I'm a total nutbag. Anyway, I read Peter's book and I was so, I was compelled to find the email on the back of the book for the I can't even remember what it was, but I, 4 a.m., I'm emailing whatever contact information was available. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I just said, thank you for telling your story. I feel less crazy. I mean, I'm not Moses, but I know Moses had to lay on his bed at night and go, okay, I'm talking to a bush that's on fire. <laughs> okay, now I'm... Okay, I know my failures. I know my weaknesses. I'm doing what? And all of us in our own journey, there, it's got to be the times that we really step out in faith, the times we trust we hear God's voice, that there are times we look down, there's no net, and you think, well, just bring me the, <laughs> the double, just bring me the straitjacket. I, I am certifiably insane. I guess... All I know to say is anything we think we understand about God is none of us knows. I mean, you know, his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. If we thought of it, it's not even close. Uh, you, you had mentioned going to therapy earlier. Uh -huh. And and so I... Um, Good luck editing all this, by the way. Uh, we're all over the map. Uh, no, we're not. No, we're not. You had mentioned going to therapy because uh, I'm looking for a therapist. Okay. What was it that that really uh, opened you up to going to a therapist? What did you look for? And how has that experience helped you? Well, I've actually been to several therapists over a course of my life in the 80s, 90s, 2000, and, <laughs> and this decade. <laughs> Nonstop. Yeah. No, no, no. I, To me, at this point, a great therapist is someone that... Um, with whom you can sort of like spread out, like you're spreading out a map on a table and you say, this is where I find myself and what, what my hope is, how, what am I missing in my toolkit? How am I, how am I blind to what's going on? Um, you know, earlier decades of therapy had to do with more damage control just from my own immaturity um, bad decisions, feeling overwhelmed. Um, and so what I was looking for in a therapist back then is, you know, I was just, somebody please hand me an air hose. I'm 50 feet underwater and mm -hmm. I can't breathe. Um, and I was grateful for every therapy session I ever sat in. I, they, you know, not every therapist is great. Um, I... Um, at this point in life, I find the most um, the most therapeutic practice that I can have is to write every day. And I don't do it every day, but I, I try to not let a week go by without just, you know, writing whatever my reality is that day, but writing and it's... Is it like journaling? It's not. It's not journaling. I would call it a brain dump. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But um, that's that's what I use my little notebooks for. I have mm -hmm. several notebooks for different purposes. Yes, and it's very important that it not be written in a way for anyone else to read, um, because there are just so few places that we can be completely honest with ourselves. And and I suggest writing and not typing mm -hmm. because when you're writing, especially cursive, your hand never stops moving and it forces you to stay engaged because you have to finish that word and then you go, what's the next word? Mm. I mean, even it's I think in our in our culture, it's even hard to contemplate. My great grandfather used to say the most important hour of the day is contemplation, but everything vies for our attention. I think it's even hard anymore for people to pray because 
ding, your phone is binging, your everything is like every technology in your life is like the interrupting toddler. And when you write as a spiritual practice, it actually can be a brain dump and then the next sentence, it's a prayer. But what it allows you to do is actually stay focused and to stay engaged. Engaged with God, engaged with whatever thing you're wrestling with, not in a in the secular, circular, chaotic chatter in your head, but actually completing a thought. And once having written that thought, you don't have to keep writing it the way your brain will do. Say something over and over again. You can just say, I want to pull my hair out. I'm so frustrated about this situation. But then you've said it. And you keep kind of processing. And so many times I find I'll just be trying to honestly articulate whatever is raging inside of me. And right as I'm kind of wrapping it up, all of a sudden I will write something that's the total opposite of that. Like it's a totally different perspective. And it will be like, it, it will be very enlightening. Mm, mm. It will be perspective changing. And I've, to me, the word perspective is, that's kind of my go-to word anymore. I feel like politically our country has lost the beauty of differing perspectives. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we tend to gravitate or want to gravitate to areas where we feel safe because everybody agrees with us. And that's frightening because it creates well, I, such a narrow perspective. Yeah, I, well, I think we live in an era of, uh, you know, the, the the whole country scene right now, sort of like college football. You know, I'm an Ohio State guy, you're a Michigan guy. Mm-hmm. You know, I hate your team. You know, it's, right, right. It's, it's, it's taken on that sort of college football mentality. Right, right. Where you live and eat and breathe by, you know, your team, you're going to stand by their side, period. You mm-hmm. know, there's... Yeah. there's uh, there's no real sense of camaraderie and want, you know, we're, we're in it together. Let me ask you on the therapy thing a minute. How can you tell if you have a good one or if you have somebody not so good, how far down the line do you get and you go, mm, I'm really not getting anything out of this? Well, I think depending on how much vulnerability you have been able to exercise about the things that are troubling or disturbing, the, the things that took you to therapy in the first place, mm-hmm. um, it can be like cleaning out a closet. I mean, some there is a process of having to pull a lot out. And so, you know, that big information dump is important in some situations, but I, it, there's a beginning and an ending to that. Mm-hmm. And I think every combination of therapist and client are unique. And one therapist might be good for one personality and not good for another. I am so grateful for someone that will give me tools. And they'll say, I want you to try this tool. Um, for me, the biggest thing is, and this is, has been true at every point in life, Um, to be reminded that delivery is everything. If something is important to you, how that is delivered is monumental. Um, I think there are probably patterns to life that we all go through. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, And I think there are times in life that are easier to gain clarity quicker, um, I think there's probably not a human being alive that doesn't go through some tunnel of feeling like a victim. It can be because of something awful that was done to you, or it can just be because you're the way that you're overwhelmed with your own life. You can feel like, how did this happen to me? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I would say a therapist that helps a client move beyond feeling like a victim Mm -hmm. Um, and empower them with their own liberty, which my favorite 
definition of liberty was um, Elie Wiesel, you know, who was in a concentration camp, and most kids in middle school have to read his book, Night. And, um, but he said liberty is not being behind bars or not behind bars. Liberty is that space that each of us experiences, that space that stands between the thing coming at us and our response to it. So in that space, in that fraction of time, whatever that thing coming at us, that we are free to respond to it. Mm. Now somebody might say, well, in the mm. case of abuse, mm -hmm. someone's not free to respond to that. Maybe not in that moment. I don't, e I don't know how that works. All I know is this was spoken by a man who was in a concentration mm -hmm. camp and his family killed. And so he's saying his liberty was the way that he processed, maybe that's it, the way he processed what happened to him, what happened to his family. It was in the processing of it that he had the freedom to choose life. That's, that's powerful. That's powerful. Thank you so much, Amy, for uh, spending this time with us and um, giving us your uh, your insight on things. And uh, we so appreciate you. Thank you. And uh, I know so many others will as well. And just for the folks listening in who never heard the conversation with you and Lauren Daigle, I'm gonna I'm gonna put that on right now as a bonus. Well, all right. Okay. We're just going to roll, as they say, roll the videotape. We're going to ro roll the audio. Okay. I guess there is Fantastic. no tape anymore, but yeah. we're going to... Roll gonna... whatever it is. Roll sound. Alexa, <laughs> can you grab for me the in-studio meetup that we did in, uh, let me see, it was September 2016 between Amy Grant and Lauren Daigle. First time they ever met up. Okay, ladies, I cannot believe that you've never met before, and it's such an honor to introduce Amy Grant and Lauren Daigle right here in our studios for the very first time to each other. I really am just going to sort of hit the record button here, and Amy, let you take it away. I want you to mentor Lauren. I think she's going to be a superstar in the years to come. I just know it. I feel it in my, in my gut. And I'd love for you to mentor her because she's going to run up against all kinds of situations, all kinds of people. And I'd love for you to just sort of give her the insight because you have been the queen of contemporary Christian music. You've been uh, so incredibly popular and a Grammy Award winner on the mainstream side. When I think of Christmas, I think of Amy Grant. Let Lauren know what to expect. They're good people everywhere. And there are not so good people everywhere. And just creatively, business-wise, um, relationship, just surround yourself with people that you respect. Mm -hmm. And that's just, you know, mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean that you have to um, think about, you don't have to hold the same opinion. Wow, uh, that's, that's good. I remember um, one of my one of the favorite people I worked with. Um, his name was David Anderley, and he was um, he worked at A and M Records. He was an artist, but he was head of A and R, and so artist relations. And we went to some hole in the wall in Los Angeles, and he had worked like from the beginning with Sting, other people that you might not know. But I loved A&M Records because the people that I grew up listening to, that was the logo spinning in the middle of that record. Um, Carol King, mm -hmm. you know, just people that I went, oh, that's, that's the logo I want. But David and I sat down and he said, he said, I'm Jewish. My first impression of Christian anything 
was a a life-size cross that somebody put in our front yard and burned because he grew up in a time where there was a lot of anti-Semitism. Wow. And he said, whatever you put on this record, I want you to speak speak to me, speak to everybody, and and be who you are. Be real. And I thought that was such great advice, um, you know, to, you just never know who you're going to be singing for or speaking to. And everybody is, um, everybody wants to be loved. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, you know, I didn't, I never drew lines in my head like, oh, this is just for church people. This is just for, you know. Um, this is secular. I don't think I've ever even used that word. You know, yeah. when you write yeah. and sing, you just, you go, oh, I love that. I love yeah. the way that makes me feel. Yeah. Wow. So just be a great communicator. And whoever you are, that's what's going to come out. Wow. What do you think about that? That is that is the driving force right now. Like um, one of my managers always says, don't write for the genre, write for the soul. Like it's not about these boundary lines of CCM versus pop versus secular versus mainstream versus Christian. Like take all of that ideology out of your head and just yeah. write for the soul. And yeah. whatever God breathes in that moment might be completely different than what we think it's supposed to sound like or think we're supposed to say as Christians trying to lead the world and things like that. Um, but if we just stay true to what's evoking, stirring us up in our spirit, then it'll help someone. It, it's just the natural byproduct of humanity. Yeah. And so um, that's what she always says, right for the soul. And don't look for the boundaries. Just just stay focused on what's ahead of you. So that and keeping good people around that you might not necessarily have the same opinions of that's huge because it's really easy to look and say oh, I, re- I respect and value this person but we really don't agree with that Uh oh what if that starts something later I shouldn't walk this road out or right. you know that that kind of silly fear comes up but not letting our hearts be opinion based but instead just respect based for each other mm-hmm. that's a big thing yeah here's I think- an- uh, also w- we change over mm-hmm. time. Yeah. And so you have to give people room to, um, you know, to be where they are right now. And you will be surprised how things that you think are really a, a big mm-hmm. issue or a dividing line at one point in life, they're not. Yeah. Who was telling me one time, I think it was Gloria Gaither, and she said, Oh my gosh, when we're young, we spend so much time saying either or, either or, you're either this or you're that. (laughs) And she said, you know, you get to the back half of your life and you go, both and. Wow. We're both and. Wow. And you just, you know, it it changes the way you look at people. Um, I'll tell you the greatest, um, greatest piece of advice I ever got from a young uh, touring artist practical advice was if you go to a radio station be nice to the guy making coffee or going for sandwiches because one day he'll run the company Mm -hmm. and um and then uh, a charming southern country gentleman named jimmy gentry he um actually enlisted in the army in World War II when he was 16 because his brothers were fighting. So he was 17. He was a 17-year-old foot soldier on when the American troops liberated the death camp at Dachau. He was 17. And he talks all the time to how life-changing that was. And he said, I've just narrowed down. There are five phrases that we should live by five phrases and you're just his accent (laughs) and uh he said the first is how can i help you 
Just remember, hold up five fingers, and that's how you remember that phrase. How can I help you? The next is four fingers. Put your thumb down, four fingers. I'm proud of you. And the third is, you can guess that, I three. Love I love you. Two. Thank you. Yes. One. Can you guess what the most important one word phrase is? The way you live your life. Oh man, kindness, humility. I was going, what, what? <laughs> Love, God, what, what? And he said, nope, nope. And he stuck up one finger and he said, we. Wow. If you look at all of life as we, we, you know, the, 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 the offender, the, um, if it's we, you go, it just changes everything. Yeah. It changes, wow. changes the way you think, the way you pray, the way you look at people. When you're writing mm. a song, mm -hmm. you're writing it for us. Wow. Wow. So, That's powerful. Yeah. I, but I've had, you know, I have had some wonderful people always in my life giving me a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And it's a great big world. Wow. I think that's why I like traveling because you start seeing th what makes other people breathe and live and thrive. And you, you start to realize that like the world is so much bigger. I mean, it's something beautiful about collecting all of the stories and all the, the things that people believe. And I just, I love that. That is amazing. I'm going to write that down. Yeah. The five things. Oh man. I got tears in my eyes. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So what do you think? Well, here's what I think is that we all have gaps in our life. And there's times that we don't think that we can go one more day, one more week, one more month with what we're facing. But let me tell you something about God. He is a father. He is a restorer. And he is a way maker. And this is what we heard with Amy, that God can make a way where there seems to be no way. How, how do we get from in the Bible where you have all of these characters who had all of these issues? Yes. I mean, lying, cheating, murdering, but still, you know, they're held in high regard when it comes to God, they're his chosen people, you know, et cetera, et cetera. How, how can we give them the uh, accolades and boy, everybody's great, but then it comes to our own lives and it's like, well, I have a problem with him because he said this or he said that or he cheated on my so-and-so or he uh, he's divorcing so-and-so and then all of a sudden it's like we write him off. What? How, how do we get to that? Number one, great observation. And so part of it is we have to get real that God uses shaky people to do sturdy projects. You know how powerful that is? Mm. He uses shaky people to do sturdy projects because he knows that he is bigger than our faults, flaws, and failures. That doesn't give us license to stay there. So I choose to get better every day. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. And I thought the other thing that was absolutely amazing with this whole thing was the uh, the, the incredible words of wisdom that uh, Amy shared with Lauren. Yes. Wasn't that amazing? Amazing, amazing. Yeah, because Amy had a different vantage point. This is not Amy Grant of 1980. Mm -hmm. She now understood pain. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so do you. So mm -hmm. do I. Mm -hmm. What does it do? Makes us empathetic, mm. compassionate. Mm. 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 That's good. Well, this has been so much fun uh, as usual. This has been uh, an honor to be with you here, my friend. And uh, it's an honor to be with those of you listening because uh, we're doing this out of love. We're, we're doing this because of you. Please do share us. Yep. And it becomes a ripple effect of love. It becomes share, a, share, share it, because you care. Thank you for that. Before we go, I want to just encourage people to go to your website and to your app because on your app, you really do care for folks that uh, they have the tools they need 
to get through some very difficult times. So tell people where they can find your app. I have an app called the Utmost app, which has become a, a best-selling app. You can get it on iTunes, Utmost, U-T-M-O-S-T. And the thing is, is that we continue to add content, including this podcast. So the app cost us about $55,000 to produce, and it costs you only $1.99 to get. So for $1.99 one time, you're going to get thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of content every single week. Utmost, utmost on iTunes. It's a great app. And I will tell you, I have been to some of your live seminars, some of your live events. Oh, yeah. Let, let's just say I've seen people come in and they're going through all kinds of stuff in their lives, right? And, and they come out of one of your seminars after a couple hours and it's like you got to scrape them off the ceiling. They've been so uh, just uh, taking in so much of these wonderful tools that you provide. Inspiration. Yes. And the fact that you're now... Putting this, a lot of people will never see your seminars because you do them uh, in places where mm -hmm. they don't live. But the fact that you are now putting that information on an app, on an app, and giving it to people for a couple of bucks is just is such a gift to to us all. Thank you. So uh, for Tim Story, this is David Sams. We'll see you next time here on CIA Contagious Influences of America. And remember. Go out there and live that life in living color because it sure is a lot more fun than living it in black and white. We'll see you next time.